series we have started uh, and it's called uh, dialoguing between the posts uh, but before i start to describe a little bit about why we are uh, doing this seminar series and its various uh, um, plans that we have for later i would invite professor shankar that from patna university if he would be kind enough to chair the session mm -hmm. so professor um and we have to have an in-house presence on the table as well so i would invite professor pushpendra uh, professor and in charge uh, tata institute of social sciences patna um Yes, and once our speaker is set, then uh, Dr. Kesha Narkovich. Um, so, as I was um, saying, just a little bit. I won't take much time because we are already starting a little bit late. Uh, why we are uh, holding this uh, seminar series? First things first, that this seminar series is part of a larger network. of scholars academics activists public intellectuals intellectuals who want to start a conversation and as you know in it's in the name itself it's dialogue between two distinct or what is perceived as distinct conditions one of which which is the post colonial conditions in which we live part of the colony part of the empire where the british french spanish so on and so forth and another is the condition which which after 1989 is called post socialist uh, condition or post socialist nations where you know after the fall of the berlin wall in 1989 um the us the collapse of the ussr the disintegration of yugoslavia and the kind of transition which happens after that uh with kind of a liberal so called liberal democracy and the problems of the transition and all of that and i would like especially to draw your attention to the historical fact that the fall of the berlin wall in 1989 and what we call liberalization in india happens almost simultaneously so in some ways the the con the historical conjuncture is not an abstract that we are imposing on on the certain reality but it's always there the, the historical conjuncture is there and the dialogue between the post colonial uh, situation and the post socialist condition is not new it's not novel at least it traces its lineage at least a decade back when people started thinking about the post socialist situation in terms of post colonial theories and decolonial theories now what we realize and before that there are two projects with which uh, tata institute of social sciences patna has been uh, associated with in personal as well as institutional capacity was one in 2015 uh, or 16 rather uh, which was this masrutka project uh, um, organized by libnis institute of regional geography so some scholars there did a summer school in in kyrgyzstan uh, and in bishkek where the, this idea was first mooted that we can have a discussion in a post colonial setting which is india and later last year in 2017 uh, there was a conference in in belgrade which was called actually dialoguing between the posts and that's from where we borrow the Uh, the title of this seminar series as well so that it, it's it's apparent that this dialogue is in continuation of various efforts which are happening and uh the the in the literature if you look at it then the predominant uh, aspect shows uh the tendency of looking what is post colonial in the post socialist conditions and vice versa in some cases now the group or the network with which uh, we are associated wants that this is there is an other way an alternative way of looking at the post colonial and post socialist thing and it is not by comparison and contrast which is there the, there are obvious strengths but as 
as constitutive not only of each other because of the historical lineages and the contemporary aspect, but it is constitutive of how global capitalism is functioning. And since Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Patna's main uh, work or its emphasis is always on labor migration. So that aspect is very heavy. I mean, we want to trace all the debates and all the movement that happened before 1989 as part of the third world solidarity and all of that, as well as after uh, in the 90s when uh, the transition is happening in, in the post-socialist countries and we have our own form of transition in the form of liberalization. So what we want to do is really to see uh, the, these two con uh, conditions at the moment of their conjuncture rather than uh, looking at it, it discreetly. So, so that is the, uh, and the idea behind this seminar series is, um, is to one, start a dialogue, but then also produce material, uh, you know, papers and more conferences perhaps. And finally, when um, we have the funds, then start a really transnational research project which covers all, uh, well, at least some part of uh, the post-colonial and the post-socialist condition. Uh, so that is a very brief uh, uh, description of uh, what, what we want to do. Uh, we are very happy that we have Dr. Kesia Narkovic uh, from uh, the University of York, the UK, and she would speak on uh, can we think post-colonially about Central and Eastern Europe perspective from Poland? And I, I understand that Professor Shankar Dutt is here and so are his students. And I was having this conversation yesterday up with Kesha about Joseph Conrad. And Joseph Conrad was a Polish writer and his English was his third language. And he chose it very, very deliberately as to why he wants to write in English when it's not his even second language. And he says that he wants to write uh, in English because it gives it him more control and dense and because it's not natural to him. And if you have read Lord Jim, the ship which sank, which was abandoned by uh, Jim, was actually called Patna. <laughs> and that Patna is this Patna. Precisely because it is, it is for sure documented that Joseph Conrad did come to Sri Lanka and Myanmar, um, what, what was Burma then. What we don't know is whether he came to India or not. But, I mean, there's no evidence as yet available. But what is also uh, true is that Patna was part of the riverway, and, uh, you know, Calcutta through the opium trade and so on and so forth. Uh, so, and, you know, what you have to remember is that Joseph Conrad, for example, for a short while didn't have a nation. And it because Poland was captured and there was no Poland as such. And this has happened before there was any concept of statelessness, which comes after uh, the Second World War. So you know these conditions have these conditions have already be, always been there. And one of the re things that we want to achieve is to actually also trace these historical, literary, aesthetic uh, linkages. So we are very happy. Uh, and. Um, uh, the final thank you note would be given by Professor Pushpendra, but right now I would like to acknowledge some of the people who are abroad. And uh, we wanted to webcast this whole event, but you know we are post-colonials. There is always something unruly and ungovernable <laughs> about our things. So the internet is not, the internet was not very fast, so we can't do the webcast. Uh, but um, the recording is here, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank the people who have been instrumental. Uh, in this. The first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Leandra Bias, uh, who is a PhD candidate in the University of Oxford, UK, and she was the one who actually suggested uh, Dr. Kesha Narkovich for this event, for the first event that we are doing. So a big thank to Leandra. Uh, then I would like to thank especially three very senior people. Uh, so Professor Marina Griznic, who is from so Slovenia, Zivka Veli uh, Velia Vicharska, who is in Pratt in the US, and Ovidio Ticindeliano, who is in Romania, 
uh, Bucharest. Uh, they have been very, very encouraging uh, of, of this initiative that we did, and they were part of the Belgrade conference. From the Marshutka project, I would like to really uh, thank uh, Dr. Leila, Leila Rekviashvili and Vladmiri Signev, who are postdoctoral uh, uh, scholars in Lebanese Institute of Regional Geography, uh, who actually um, did the Marshutka project and the summer school. And the next one is happening in Georgia. And I would be very happy to, to uh, give the details because it's also meant for students. Um, I would also like to thank um, Raya Apostolova and Svetlina Ristova, who are part of this, uh, this initiative, and also uh, Professor Rositsa Gwencheva, who is in New Bulgarian University and provided a space for the dialogue to happen uh, last year. And three other people, Katarina Kusic, Polina Manolova, and Philip Lotholz, who were uh, instrumental in organizing uh, the Belgrade conference in 2016. And I really want to thank Professor Shankar that not only for chairing the session, but bringing so many students. It's really heartening because most of the research is going to be done by you guys. So uh, I, I think please listen. And if you find interesting enough, let's start doing some good research. So uh, Professor Shankar, that whenever you are ready, you can call the session on. And thank you. I think without any further delay, uh, we are all very eager to hear Dr. Kasia uh, Narkovich. Uh, I was having uh, an initial conversation with her before we got started and found that her initial training was in human geography. And human <coughs> geography actually encompasses just about everything, just about everything that uh, concerns each individual as being conscientious members of a global community. Uh, it's a way in which any kind of a human action impacts this earth that we live in. And therefore, taking off from there into the field of sociology and then going into the studying post-coloniality, which I understand more as a metaphor, because uh, Poland was never really uh, colonized in the sense in which, let's say, India has been colonized in many countries in Africa and Asia, and um, even today. There are certain countries, there are two countries, which still remain colonized uh, by Britain that is in the Atlantic. Uh, but what she is probably going to speak about is using post-coloniality as metaphor and post-socialist quite obviously. And I'm very, very keen to try and understand exactly how, whether in, in, in whatever myriad ways this post-socialist condition has impacted not only Poland and uh, let's say the socialist bloc that existed after the world became bipolar following the Second World War, but also the many other countries which were, and particularly the, the set of countries that were a part of what was earlier known as the, I don't like to use the word third world, that does not exist anymore, but let's say in the non-aligned nations, what they had in common was the history of being colonized. But how that would also impact this post-socialist condition would impact uh, these nations as well, as there seems to be within this monster called capitalism, how uh, exactly the disparities in each one of these nations have been continually growing. And the larger impact that is, it's going to have within our societies and how that is going to pan out in the years that's to come. So without any further delay, it's all yours. Thank you. So eagerly waiting <laughs> to hear you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for this introduction. And thank you all for coming to listen to me. I'm really happy to be talking about this in India, in a post-colonial country, because normally I present these kind of things in England or maybe once or twice in Poland. So it's really special to do it in this context, and I hope we can continue doing it 
been you know, located in a post-colonial context. And you're right, Poland has not been colonized like India. That's why my talk has this question mark. Can we think post-colonially about Central and Eastern Europe with a question mark? Because there's disagreements about this, right? So Poland has not been colonized by uh, Britain like India has. But there has been moments in history, and I will go through this in a bit, that kind of lend it to be maybe a little bit more than a metaphor. I mean, maybe we need to think about it as a metaphor, but maybe we can actually stretch kind of um, a little bit more. I mean, I'm talking about post-coloniality definitely as kind of a conceptual category rather than a chronological category. But um, yeah, you made me think about this metaphor idea. I'm not sure if it's metaphor or if it's more than that. Well, let's see. Right. So I will um, just today point out a kind of key points in Polish history that I think affect this post-colonial condition. And um, within that, I will talk about how Poland throughout its history, or at least in the last hundred years or so, has been considered as the other of Europe, so kind of <coughs> Europe's other, and how that has affected its national identity, its thinking about itself, etc. But I will also talk about how Poland has been active in othering, so not only being the victim of being othered, but also actively participating and contributing to the othering, particularly of its minorities. Right, and then I will talk about the current moment, which I study, because I actually don't study Poland historically, I study the, about the current conflicts in the Polish public sphere. So I'll talk about how the right-wing movement in Poland particularly uses a lot of post-colonial theory and post-coloniality to justify a nationalist kind of project, a right-wing nationalist project. Okay. Okay. So I think a really important kind of part or aspect of the way we think about Poland's current condition dates back to um, when Poland was actually not existing. And you said it was for a short while, but actually it was 123 years that Poland ceased to exist. It wasn't part of a European map, right? And that was partly justified because Poland was considered to not be as developed as other countries in Europe and was a bit slow, was uh, not industrializing, was relying on agriculture. And so countries um, such as Prussia, Austria and Russia divided Poland and thought this is for the best, you know, it will speed up its development. Um, and then it um, appeared back on the map when it gained independence in 1918. But soon after, it wasn't long uh, before the Second World War and again the occupation of Germany, of Poland, uh, and Poland becoming the site, and this is obviously interesting for a geographer, becoming a site for this mass execution of people, Jews of course, but not only Jews, also Polish intelligentsia, gay people, other undesirable categories of people. And I will mention this, um, I will talk about kind of Poland's role in that a little bit later on, but um, you know, it was largely kind of a German initiative, however Poland was not only like the victim of that. I will mention this in a while. And of course, after the Second World War, communis communism happened. And when I talk about communism, um, in Poland, communism is understood as a, another system of imposition imposed by the Soviet. Um, it happened to Poland, who really wanted to be on the other side of the Iron Curtain, so they ended up on the wrong side. And they were, uh, it was not their initiative, right? And so even though there were many things in the communist system that lasted for quite a few years that were quite beneficial, was quite beneficial for people, for example, um, social welfare, you know, there was no unemployment, there were kindergartens where you could send your kids and actually go to work, uh, women's active participation in the labor force, yet all of this, um, you know, was quite resisted because I guess there were no other, um, there, were, there was no freedom of expression and there was obviously no civil society, etc. So that period gave birth to the, uh, a massive so civil society movement called the Solidarity, Solidarność, led by Lech Wałęsa, which you might be familiar with, right? Um, and that eventually, you know, um, dismantled communism and introduced democracy. But what happened in those years after 89 was very traumatic. So there was, Poland was, you know, speeded through and went through the so-called shock therapy, where um, capitalist economy was introduced very quickly. And so suddenly from zero unemployment, we had a big unemployment, people migrated 
because they lost their jobs. Um, and there was a lot of kind of trauma happening at that point, which I think is also important in kind of how we think about Poland today. Um, and then, you know, not long after happened the 2004 um, accession to the EU. So Poland became one of the first countries of the kind of former Eastern Bloc that got incorporated into European Union in 2004. And again, what happened after, the foreign funding just poured in. And um, that has its consequences as well that I'm going to mention in a bit. And the moment that I'm going to uh, spend some time uh, on is the 2015, which is the moment where the right-wing party, Prawo i Sprawiedliwość, so law and justice, justice, got elected into the Polish government. Now, they've been in power recently, but the big change is where the right, what has shifted in the political kind of climate. So the right now works quite closely with quite far-right ideas and is much about kind of a post-colonial approach to building the nation, a rebuilding Polish nation, you know, conserving Polish Catholicism, etc. Right. Okay, so I'm just going to present now different ways in which Poland has been othered throughout its history by various people and things like that. So one person um, that is a, was a German historian, he was quite an influential German historian, Leopold von Ranke, um, in 1824, was speaking about Poland uh, in this kind of way. He said, it cannot be maintained that these peoples too belong to the unity of our nation. So he made European countries, he, he saw that as one unity. So their customs and constitution have ever separated them from it. In that epoch, they exercised no independent influence, but merely appeared subordinate or antagonistic. Right, so this is the idea that Poland, you know, there's one Europe, of course, but Poland is on the side of that, so it's the less civilized, the kind of irrational, the superstitious, the industrially backward part of Europe that is not really um, contributing to this great European development. And other figures as well. This was actually Hegel we probably all know about, he was talking about Slavs, so people from that region. And he said, this entire body of peoples remain excluded from our consideration. It has not appeared as an independent element in the series of phases that reason has assumed in the world. Right, so Hegel, I mean, is known for um, this kind of racial thinking. So he saw the European people as at the top of the civilizational ladder, and then came the Asians, then came the Africans. And so within that category of Caucasians, which he thought were superior, um, Slavs were at the bottom of that category. And so um, the scholar um, named Tibebu, who works on Hegel in the Third World, says that actually um, Hegel saw Slavic people as remnants of Asiatic hordes whose contribution to world history was nothing but destruction, right? So like in the quote above. And so um, Hegel mm, kind of justified that way of thinking about Slavic people in terms of a lacking sense of individuality among Slavic people, um, obviously reliance on agriculture, not being keen on the Enlightenment project, and being kind of stuck between Christian Europe and non-Christian Asia. Hegel gave a little bit of credit to Central and Eastern Europe for kind of uh, protecting <laughs> Europe and being like a guard of the Christian Europe, so they, they got some credit, but otherwise he was quite skeptical. He was also, as a Protestant, he was skeptical to Catholicism, saying that Catholicism has, there's no rationality possible within Catholicism. Right. Um, so this is, um, Kind of how these historical figures were talking about Poland, but even Stuart Hall, uh, not that long ago, talked about Eastern Europe not really belonging to the proper West. And I think the key things is in the brackets, uh, the key two questions that he asked, doesn't yet, never did, are really crucial in the way um, that I understand Central Eastern Europe's kind of position in the global hegemony. Because there's this yetness attached to us as Central and Eastern European, which means that actually there's always a potential within us to catch up. And, and when we do, we will maybe not be completely like the Western Europeans, but there's still this potential inherent in us that for other categories of humans has not been there. Um, so I think this is really important. And of course, this uh, desire to become the West, as Mignolo and Tolstanova has been writing about, it is quite strong in Poland. And it became very evident at the 2004 EU referendum 
where more people went out to vote to be part of Europe than they usually do in parliamentary elections. So there was much higher voter turnout. And overwhelmingly, I think it was 77 or so percent of people said that they do want to join the EU. So it was overwhelmingly positive. And yet, the representation of polls at that time in Western media, such as the BBC, um, is quite interesting because you can see this um, woman, uh, it's, she's kind of representing this babushka-like figure with her headscarf coming probably on her horse and cart to vote, to be part of the EU. And these are the images that I have seen growing up in the West, coming from Poland, consistently about Poland. So there's always people coming on horse and cart and voting. BBC and all those uh, magazines or newspapers are presenting us like this. And it's not obviously representative of Poland. Of course, there are people in the that look like that but this is the overwhelming picture right so still despite that Poland kind of joined it's still this category of other that is still happening there and uh, what was interesting was at that time um, the former president well Kwasniewski who was the president at that time said um, of this uh, turnout that we have returned to the European family Right? And this is really interesting because when you return to something, that means actually your home is there. So what he did with this quote is that he kind of very much separated Poland from its Central and Eastern European neighbors, saying that, you know, we might have been on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain, but now we're back because here's where we belong. So there's this kind of self, um, you know, the, the construction of the self as being really part of the West, even though um, it's not, you know, seen as that always. Right, and so what happened after 2004 was that a lot of Western funding um, poured into Poland. And there has been positive um, consequences of that, like we have built our infrastructure a lot and we got some great bridges and motorways and things like that. But from my point of view, studying the civil society, this has been also quite detrimental because what has happened is what we have seen in, for example, South America, an NGOization of the civil society when it became all about, you know, some more powerful groups that were able to write these uh, grant applications in English to get funding for very specific projects. And so it kind of crushed some of the grassroots um, civil society that was there. So so much Western funding happened that Piketty even called the region foreign owned. So when Piketty assessed, um, he was talking about the impact of a kind of foreign ownership on measuring inequalities in the region. He said about Central and Eastern Europe that these countries are largely foreign owned, but the owners tend to come from EU countries, in particular from Germany. So in some sense, it is not entirely different from the situation of peripheral regions that are being owned by more prosperous central regions in a large federal country. Now, he treated and talked about Central and Eastern Europe as a periphery, but also treated this as not, you know, these are not independent countries. And so this is really problematic, but I guess there is a consequence of this project that has been happening for some time since 89. Right, so with all of those um, examples that I've taken, then the question that um, Maria Janion asked, the Polish philosopher, can a story about Slavdom and about Poland be told from a post-colonial critique? Then I would say yes, of course it can. But it becomes complicated when we start thinking about also Poland's role in othering. So I will kind of, from showing you how Poland was othered to showing you how Poland was active in the othering to just be able to kind of show the other side of that. Because um, often these narrations about kind of Poland's Poland being the victim of all sorts of foreign domination, so right, Russia, Austria, Germany, the Soviet, and now even the EU, that tends to kind of forget or maybe even um, overshadow Poland's own uh, participation in the othering of others. Right. So, um, in relation to its eastern borderlands, Poland has been quite hegemonic. So in the 14th and 15th century, Poland actually incorporated um, what, um, what is now um, kind of Belarus and Ukraine, so on the eastern side of Poland, um, they incorporated that into what then was the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So these so-called eastern borderlands were always narrated as this kind of space of freedom and space of fear, and it was a bit wild, and that's where the Muslims lived 
lived and all of that kind of talk is very much like a colonial kind of talk towards its eastern neighbors. Right, and uh, while this is more well known, another fact that is lesser talked about is how Poland actually um, tried to colonize parts of Africa. So at one point in the 30s, this was a failed mission, but nevertheless Poland had this ambition of colonizing outside of Europe. And the way that it was justified by a politician in 1930s was like this. We Poles, like the Italians, have the right to demand that export markets, as well as areas for settlements, be open to us, so that we may obtain raw materials necessary to the national economy under conditions similar to those enjoyed by the colonial state. So Poland was feeling, you know, as not being able to enjoy all these privileges of Western European countries and wanted to kind of also catch up in that way, right, be a colonial um, nation. And even, of course, though it failed, it is still important to think that the racial thinking in Europe at that time didn't escape Poland. So there was a lot of this kind of thinking and eugenics and all of these kind of things that did not um, kind of, were not isolated uh, for Western Europe and they definitely were present in Central and Eastern Europe. And while this mission failed, you know, Poland has a long and prominent history of exclusion of its minorities. So at once, um, a while ago, Poland was quite a multicultural country, so it had quite a big Jewish population. In fact, I think it had the largest Jewish population in Europe, and it had also other minorities that were residing, residing within Poland. But now, Poland is one of the absolutely most homogenous countries in Europe. And so there is this process that has happened over a long time that we need to really think about how Poland has consistently excluded its minorities. So, for example, when it comes to the Jewish um, uh, minority, there were quite a few um, Jewish people that left Poland for um, South America, for um, US as well, um, well before the Second World War. So there was about two million Jews that left. And the fact that they left uh, was obviously conditioned by the anti-Semitism in Poland, right? So it's not like anti-Semitism didn't exist and came with the Germans. But Poles are not very comfortable talking about this history. Um, one other thing to mention, uh, in the 60s, Jewish people were asked, uh, around the formation of Israel, Jewish people were asked to leave Poland and with that also shed their Polish passport, so they were like excluded. Um, so this kind of anti-Semitism continued well after the Second World War as well. But as I said, Polish people are not very comfortable with this past. In fact, a few weeks ago, there's this law that has been passed, and it's an anti-deformation law, also named the Holocaust law. So it makes it actually um, illegal to talk about Polish involvement in um, what, what the government sees as German crimes. So any kind of active participation in anti-Semitism is not allowed. So I guess now what I'm doing is breaking the law because I'm not allowed to speak like this. But the problem with that is that it's a highly populist kind of uh, policy because um, anyway in Poland we're not talking about when Polish people participated in the oppression of Jewish people. We are much more keen to talk about how we actually were the saviors in that particular relations. And of course there were Polish people who um, helped and assisted Jewish people who were hiding Jewish people, you know, for them not to be sent to Auschwitz and other concentration camp that were camps that were located in Poland. But many Polish people also killed Jewish people, not because they were ordered to, but because they did that themselves. And so not being able to talk about this is really problematic, right? Uh, but despite this long history, now the kind of public attitudes towards Jews are a little bit milder. So actually, Jews are not the primary kind of enemy within. Now it's Muslims. So since a few years back, Muslims occupy the kind of um, most um, unattractive, I guess, minority within Poland, right? So there's a lot about um, you know the refugees and this kind of Islamophobia spiked in 2015 with the recent. Um, uh, refugee crisis and Poland actually banned Muslim, ref Muslim refugees from coming to Poland so they didn't fulfill the EU quota that was suggested for EU countries of how many refugees from Syria and other countries they should take and they said that we will only take Christian refugees so about like few people came you know and there, there were pictures that to show that Poland is so you know welcoming to Christian Syrians but not to Muslims. 
Um, and so all this is part of this kind of resurging Catholic nationalist identity. And as you can see in this poster, it says, not Islamic, not secular, only Catholic Poland, we want God. So what is happening now in Poland, it's very much framed, it's a very much kind of anti-secular, but also anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant kind of um, ideology that is put forward. And it is framed as kind of protecting Poland and also by extension the European civilization uh, from this kind of threat from the outside, and particularly this kind of Islamic threat that is going to take over Europe. Right. And the way that it was manifested in a really interesting way was last year <coughs> when an organization managed to get um, a lot of people to go to travel to the borders of Poland with the rosary beads and pray at the borders for you know saving Poland it, there was a slogan save Poland and the world with the rosary so many people actually traveled and they had uh, kind of the public transport was for free then so many people were joking like we're going to pretend we're going to go to the borders but we're actually just going to travel like to the other side of Poland on holiday but Joke aside, it's quite serious because quite a few people joined this and the organizers in the press release uh, advocating for this um, event wrote, specifically targeted this event as being something that is, um, you know, to save Poland from Islam especially. So they said, today Islam is flooding us and we are afraid of this too. We are afraid of terrorist threats and we are afraid of people departing from the faith. And just to kind of make this point that actually in Poland there are uh, about 35,000 Muslims living and these are both Tatars that have been in Poland for centuries and newer migrants that came from Arab countries during the socialist period and also recently quite a few people have started converting to Islam. I mean when I say quite a few we're talking about less than 100 probably. So this makes uh, the number of Poles in, uh, Muslims in Poland to 0.01%. So it's a really small number. But Polish people actually think that there are 7% Muslims in Poland. And they think that soon there will be 12%. Right? So they are worried about this escalation from 7% to 12%, which is why they're occupying the borders with the rosaries. Right? So this is just how powerful these narratives are in Poland. And these kind of initiatives are even if they're not initiated by the government, they're very much supported by the government. And this is one example of how uh, uh, an initiative was uh, supported by the government, and this is the Polish Independence March. Now, every year Poland celebrates its independence, but since 2009, two far-right groups, or member of, members of two far-right groups, are organizing the Independence March, right? And usually there has been, you know, a few thousand people joining with that march and very kind of nationalistic, very masculinist, um, very anti-immigrant. Um, the problem this, uh, sorry, last year, 2017, was that um, there was around 60,000 people that joined this march. So there was a quite a big shift from the previous year. And I was in London at that time, I think this was November, and I got calls from all sorts of media saying, can you comment on why 60,000 Nazis are marching in Poland today? And I thought, this is um, not the case, actually. This is not the 60,000 Nazis that are marching. It's maybe more serious than that. It is 60,000 regular Poles that are marching behind this, you know, 100, uh, 100 people who are from the far-right organizations. And I think, if anything, this is more serious because we have, this is how we see how the right has shifted and being very comfortable with this kind of um, far-right narrative. Right, and what they do, these uh, far-right organizations, from like a gender lens, because I work on gender as well, is that they often put women um, in the front of their movement. So they call them the guards of the independence march. So there would be some of these women wa walking in the front and, you know, being the guards. <clears throat> so they use this kind of feminist language. And also, as you can see in the bottom right, in the feminist imagery is being very much used in uh, kind of furthering this far-right, quite hostile to women and immigrants agenda. 
So for example, one, the posters that you see on your right says, let's save women, let's not let immigrants in. So is this idea that's also quite popular in Western Europe, this idea that if we let refugees in, um, this is obviously racialized, so there are certain refugees and certain immigrants that are less wanted. If we let them in, they will rape our women, and women are seen as this kind of reproducers of the Polish culture, Polish nation. So this is all quite kind of uncomfortable uh, appropriation of the feminist agenda that they do. And other things, another appropriation that is happening is in, uh, related to the post-colonial theory or post-coloniality or the way of thinking uh, post-colonially. And one conservative journalist who has been quite prominent into kind of promoting this idea uh, said this, uh, I have long argued that Poland is the same as post-colonial countries. In every country that has for generations been dominated by foreign rule, there is always a cultural division between those who stick, sometimes overtly to their tradition, and those who equally enthusiastically want to get rid of it, believing that the road to normality, to civilization, means shedding of one's past. And I don't think this comment is um, controversial or really problematic as such. I think there is this division in Poland. But the way he uses um, these insights and post-colonial theory is in this um, starting this movement called Endetia Movement. And he started this in 2016. And the idea behind it is to bring back Polish nationalism and end colonial war in Poland. So he talks about this kind of division there. And he uses post-colonial theory to kind of put forward this nationalism that is quite hostile to um, minorities and refugees, but also quite hostile to the EU. So he wants to withdraw Poland from the EU. Right, and there has been, um, oh, and very importantly, Endetia is inspired by this uh, very famous figure, Roman Dmowski, who's a fam who was a famous anti-Semite and nationalist in Poland. So uh, Polish right wing is quite comfortable now kind of linking with these quite controversial figures. <clears throat> right, and so the commentary from um, you know, feminist scholars and post-colonial scholars in Poland and in the region is that there has been this kind of hostile takeover within the Polish right wing of post-colonial theory. And people are asking questions like, what does this mean? You know, um, how, how is it so that post-colonial theory becomes practically monopolized by the political right? And does this mean that post-coloniality, when applied to Central and Eastern Europe, is really dangerous because it's so attractive to right-wing politics? And Korolczuk and Graf, um, who are feminist scholars in Poland, recently wrote that the case of Poland shows that the notion of colonization is infinitely pliable in right-wing discourse, and it can be effectively used in countries with no obvious colonial history. Now, does that mean that we should abandon that kind of thinking? I don't know, but I think that the reason why this uh, post-coloniality has been used by the right-wing in Poland is because, and why it's so popular, is that, that the right-wing in Poland are really the only groups that offers a critique of Western imperialism in Poland, while the liberal uh, and the left are unable to do so. And this links to what Madina Tolstonova talks about when she uh, talks about the kind of fraught relationship between the post-colonial and the post-communist, because people from the post-communist region are often not so keen to critique the global capitalist order, and this obviously stems from our history. Um, so I will end now um, with kind of just my thoughts about this. Um, so in my uh, thinking, it is true that there are these two camps. And so one is the right-wing populist. They are now in power. And they rely very much on post-colonial rhetoric. And they advance ideas about you know, Polish independence from foreign rule. So this is, um, you know, EU is also seen as this kind of foreign imposer. They're very Catholic, but they're promoting a very specific form of Catholicism. They're anti-immigration. They're anti-feminist. They're trying to um, uh, make so abortion is illegal in Poland, but they're trying to make it even more illegal than it is. They're quite anti-gay, etc. So um, all the groups that kind of threaten a conservative Polish Catholic identity, they oppose. Right, and then we have the kind of opposition, which is the liberal left-wing opposition, and they rely very much on Western liberalism to critique the right. So they always kind of talk about these liberal Western values. They are quite keen on um, having the EU come with different kind of 
punishments or disciplinary actions towards the um, towards Poland to show like that Poland is bad. But the problem with doing that is that um, it doesn't work in Poland, at least not anymore. So what I have argued is that there's this need for this kind of third space where actually we can critique the right wing and what they are doing, but we can also offer critique to Western uh, imperialism. And I think that is really needed because when that is not there, then people get attracted to this kind of right wing populism that is there, that the government offers currently. Right, so um, I want to end just with a quote by Madina Tolstanova, um, kind of encouraging, I think, what we spoke about yesterday, Mitrilesh, like about maybe not talking so much about the theory, but actually thinking about how can we resist this, this kind of issue that I identified just now. So she says, what if instead of determining if and how we can apply post-colonial theory to post-communist spaces, we start instead with the geopolitics and body politics of knowledge growing out of the local history, subjectivities and experiences of Eastern and Southeastern Europe, Central Asia, Caucasus and Russia. Right, so I'm going to end here and open for the discussion. Um, and here's just some resources if you're interested in the topic. Thank you.